Okay, next we're going to talk about um, the system properties that we discussed it previously in general, but this time we're going to talk about them specifically for LTI systems. So, if a system is LTI, then its impulse response tells you everything about what the system does, which means if we revisit some of the properties, for example, causal, and we have an LTI system, then it's an even simpler statement what it means to be causal. Notice that um, a causal system, if you have an input at, um, you know, a, an input should only affect future outputs. So what this means is that H of T should only have non-zero outputs after time zero. So here's time zero. In other words, if it's causal, it cannot have any outputs here. Okay, it has to be zero. Must be zero, the impulse response must be zero for all negative points in time. So, h of t equals zero for all t less than zero. That's what it means to be causal, very simple, right? Um, sometimes people get this confused and they think, oh, that, you know, it should be the opposite statement. It should be that it's zero for all positive points in time. And I think that thinking is a little bit backwards. You're thinking about negative t as being the past, and you know causal says that the current output should only depend on the past. But it's a little bit backwards. Think about it this way. If you tap it at time zero, it can come out later. You can have, you can have um, that affect future outputs, which is what this impulse response means for future, for positive uh, t. But, it, but it, tapping it at time zero shouldn't have caused things non-zero things to come out before uh, t equals zero. Similarly, if you have m the memory list property, it's even more uh, restrictive. So now, what you put in at time zero can only affect what comes out at time zero. So the only um, possible systems that are LTI, remember these are LTI systems, would be a delta function at time zero, okay, if it's continuous time. A discrete time, same thing, a delta function at time zero. So, of course, it can be scaled by anything, let's say by C. So, a memoryless system in, dis in continuous time would be H of T equals C delta T. That's all it can be. C can be any complex number. All right, in, d in discrete time, same thing. C delta N. So these would be called amplifiers. They don't do anything more sophisticated. Whoops. Uh, nothing more so sophisticated than just amplify the signal. Okay. Now, keep in mind, these are properties we're assuming for the system is LTI. If the system was an LTI, of course, you can have more sophisticated memoryless processes or causal systems. Okay, here's a nice one. What about stable? We had this BIBO stable. The bounded input, bounded output stable. So, if it's an LTI system, there's something very cool about the, um, about the impulse response that will tell you if it's stable or not. It turns out that if you integrate the absolute value of the impulse response, Okay, negative infinity to infinity. So, integrate this. And if that's less than infinity, this is exactly the condition for which it is bibostable. I'd like to argue that a little bit right now because I don't think this is obvious that you would guess that that's the condition. Um, so, the first thing is, um, well, Let's show that if this is true, then it's BIBO stable. Okay. So let's prove that the condition that you know the, the above implies stable. All right. I'm going to change the color for a minute. Okay, well, we know that uh, for BIBO stable, we, we assume that 
x of t is less than some b1, some bound for all t. All right, this is, and then we want to prove that, you know, we want to prove there exists a b1 and a b2, such that if it's less than b1, then the output is less than b2 for all time. Fine, so we assume that. Um, therefore, the output, let's say y of t, is the convolution of x of t convolved with y of t, whoops, with, with the impulse response, h of t. Therefore, the absolute value of y of t, or if it's complex, of course, that means magnitude, that equals the absolute value, this. And let's plug in what that integral is. x of tau, h of t minus tau. You know, I would rather put it um, backwards just because Remember, it commutes, so let's just, let me choose to do it this way. Okay, now one thing about sums are, if you have an absolute value of a sum, um, that's always less than the sum of the absolute values. This is something usually referred to as a triangle inequality, that's one way to see it, but anyway, that you know, the, if you have 5 plus negative 3, absolute value, that's 2. But if you have uh, 5, absolute value of 5 plus the absolute value of negative 3, that's 8. So it only gets bigger if you put the absolute value on each one separately. An integral is like a big sum. So it's, in fact, less than or equal to if we bring the integral out and bring the absolute value in. So we have the absolute value of everything in that integral, which is like everything in a sum. Okay, now absolute value of a product is the product of the absolute values. So get this type of thing. X. Um, and finally, we know that x is bounded. So the second absolute value here is, is less than b1. All right, b1, b tau, bring the b1 out, and we get the whole thing is less than b1 times this integral, which happened to be our condition. Our condition was that this second thing was finite. So there you go. b2, just define this thing as b2, and it's less than b2. Okay, so that worked. But how do we know that's the sharp condition? In other words, the opposite direction as well. If that's not true, is it truly not stable? And that's true. So prove that um, stable implies condition. Uh, of course, that means or not condition, these are the same same logical steps, implies not stable. Okay, so the objective here is to design x of t to make the output blow up. So let x of t be the phase, be e to the i times the phase of h of uh, negative t. So that may seem weird, but you'll see that this is going to cause it to blow up. Okay. Hmm. So it's got the negative of the phase of the flipped uh, input. This, this is like an input that's tuned just right for our impulse response h. Notice that y of t equals the integral of e to the negative i phase h of negative tau, and then I'm going to write h, well, it's h of t minus tau, but we can write h as its magnitude and phase. So that's um, 
e to the negative i phase h of negative tau. And this is magnitude of h t minus tau e to the i phase h t minus tau. All right. So that's y of t for all time. I only want to look at it at time zero because that's in particular where I'm going to get it to have a very large quantity at time zero. So all I have to do is plug in t equals zero and t only appears in two spots here. So it's negative infinity to infinity. Let's uh, let's put okay well let's bring the two phases together. I'm going to move this part to the front here. h of negative tau and then it's going to be e to the now if I put zero there, this is h of negative tau, and that's h of negative tau. So notice it's e to the negative i, h of negative tau, and then it's e to the i, the phase of h of negative tau, d tau. And conveniently, the phase goes away because of how I've designed my input. So this equals the integral of h of negative tau. The negative tau doesn't matter anymore because I could do a change of variables with h of positive tau. So that equals infinity. So what have I done here? I've actually designed um, so notice that my input is less than 1 less than or equal to 1 in magnitude. Well it equals 1. Let's just say it equals 1 in magnitude for all time. Therefore, I've satisfied the, the uh, condition of BIBO. The input should be bounded, bounded by one, but the output is unbounded, it's infinite. So this is not stable. Okay, so, so there we go. There's a very interesting example of a signal, of a system that's not stable. Um, example, very surprising one. It's a, um, let's let h of t equal sink of t. It, okay, so in the time domain, the impulse response is sink. By the way, we know some things about this system. It's a, uh, well, according to our properties, it's not causal or memoryless. It's not causal, all right? Because the output at negative points in time is non-zero caused by our impulse function at time zero. Okay, so this is not causal. But in terms of stable, it's also not FIBO stable. And you can convince yourself that when you integrate sync, the absolute value of sync, we already know some things about the integral of sync, which I'll get to in the next lesson. But the integral of the absolute value of sync will not converge because the form of sync is a sine of pi t over pi t. And the sine is periodic, so that keeps keeps rising to a value of 1 periodically. But the divided by pi t, that's divided by a linear function in time. If you recall, the integral of 1 over t does not converge when you integrate to t equals infinity. So it's um, for the same reason, the integral of the absolute value of sink of t does not converge. What's surprising about this is a, it's, this is referred to as a low-pass filter because and if, if your system is doing a convolution with a sink, then in the frequency domain, h of f, the Fourier transform of sink is wrecked rect of f. That means that in the frequency domain, remember, convolution in time becomes multiplication in frequency. So what we're saying is that we have a system that just multiplies the frequency of our input signal by zero if the frequency is too high. If the frequ For those frequency components that are low, it passes them through. It doesn't change them. So that's a low pass filter. It removed high frequencies. And yet just the fact of removing high frequencies from an input could cause it to be unstable. It could, the, the output could blow up at particular points in time. 
that's I find that very surprising. When you take a look at what signal you had to put in here to make the sink make the low pass filter have a problem, it ends up looking like a square wave that transitions that it's a square wave, but at some point at time zero it doesn't flip from zero to one. Every other increment it flips back and forth between one and negative one. But at time zero it just skips. It doesn't flip for one duration. And anyway that becomes the uh, signal that causes a problem here. Okay, lastly we have this idea of invertible. And uh, think for a moment of what it would mean to be invertible. Again, this, this is very much simplified by realizing that convolution in time is multiplication in frequency. So if we think of it that way, we say y of f equals x of f, the input, times the Fourier transform of the impulse response. So this is the output in the frequency domain, and this is the input in the frequency domain. Now, to be invertible, it says that if you know the output, you could figure out the input. Fine. So with this equation, what what would be the condition on h of f such that knowing y, we can always recover x? And the condition is simply that h of f should not be equal to 0 for all f. If it's not equal to 0 for all frequencies, then you can recover x. If it is equal to 0, and the worst situations are when, you know, h of f, let's say here's the magnitude of h of f plotted. If it equals 0 for entire durations of frequencies, then you've lost a ton of your signal. Because whatever you put in that was in those frequencies, that frequency range, it doesn't come out. You can't recover that. Now, sometimes you have other ones that technically are not invertible because they cross at zero. So it might be like just at a moment it's zero. And true, still not invertible because that exact frequency would be lost. Uh, but at least you're close. Like if you knew something like that the for if you knew that the spectrum of your input was continuous, then it wouldn't be a problem to lose isolated points. Okay, it would it would always be a problem to lose whole regions. It's the frequency space.